<laughs> yeah, all this stuff going on up in Congress and all this stuff happening. Uh, there was a man, y'all might have read this on the news. A man parked his bicycle near the Capitol of Washington, D.C., and he walks on. A police officer stops him and asks, why do you park your bicycle here? Why don't, don't you know that it's a VIP road and all congressmen and senators pass by here? And the man replied, don't worry about that, I locked it. <laughs> oh, praise God. That was awesome praise and worship. Especially that end. Let me tell you something we got to do. Now listen carefully to me. When we come to praise and worship, and, and I just got through taking a whole semester on this, and, and Lord started speaking to me and said, you big dummy. That's why I gave you this course when I did. Because you need it right now. Let me tell you something. Style is important. The style is very important. And, and, and response is important. But you know how to get the most out of praise and worship? Is when the spirit, when our spirit is connected. Amen. Connected to his. And what happens is, if we get in here, and we just say it like this. If we get in here and we say, well, I don't like that. I don't like this. Or I wish this was this way. I wish it was that way. All of a sudden, it becomes about us. And once it becomes about us, God says, okay, y'all can have it. So my question is, do you want God to go, okay, you want it, you got it, or do you want God to say, man, that smells good? I was out there cooking yesterday, and the neighbors were all working, they stopped, because they smelled like cooking. I'm such a good cook on that ground, the best cook around when I'm grilling. So I'm grilling, and everybody's stopping to look, even the dogs walking my way. Now, even, even the, look, look, and so what I'm going to say is, though, because it smells so and they walk in the house and then it says, you recognize how it smells to God when we worship Him? Oh man. Slap me right in the face with a wet fish. So let me tell you something. Come next Sunday, anytime, anytime, even in your car when you're riding down the road, whatever it is, when you're wherever you're at, if you've got all your if, ands, and buts, and you've got to have all your cross and T's crossed and all your I's dotted, and if it ain't right here, it ain't right there, then we don't want to have any part of it. When you start that, God says, then have it. It should be, God, am I pleasing to you? Am I worshiping you? This other stuff's a vehicle, but am I worshiping you? Because as everybody starts doing this, worshiping him, guess what happens? There is a mass power of God comes over the place. Like on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord. They were in one place in one accord. And once they all got their eyes on God, it took them ten days to get their eyes on God. Well, Sunday morning, I ain't got ten days. <laughs> Amen. I got a little girl who said she wanted to be here this morning. Got up sick. And said, Dad, you tell them I wanted to be there so bad. And I thought about some people are here, so I sure wish I weren't here. God, it's not about me. It's about you. And God, help me get out of the way so that you can be glorified. And when I get out of the way, you step in and things are awesome. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, it's not a Bible state. This, this sermon come up at this time either. I read it last week, so I read the whole chapter. So I'm not going to read the whole chapter again this week. We started out last week in the book of Job. Y'all say amen or out or something. Amen. Everybody's looking at a picture out there. All right. How do you want to see the church grow? I mean, really grow. Amen. Here's how it's going to grow when we get our eyes off of us and get our eyes on Him. Because people don't want to come in where our eyes are on us. They want to come in when their eyes are on God. When I come in, I'm hurting. When I come in hurting, I don't need to be thinking about me. I don't need to be thinking what's going on here. I need to be thinking about God. And get my mind on Him and watch what He can do. Amen? So here we go. Ready? You got your Bible to say amen? Right. Turn to the book of Job, but just stay there. You ain't got to, you ain't got to read it right now. But just, just there. Turn to the book of Job. And we're going to go back and forth and use it as a reference, all right? Okay. Handle your hurts. Now, now again. Now again, watch this. Has there ever been a time in your life when you just wanted the pain to stop. You just wanted something, somehow you wanted to know that God was there and that God was listening 
and that God hadn't pulled the plug on you, God hadn't closed the door on you, that the heavens had not been sealed over with steel. But see, when all this is going on, but what do you do when, when your life is hurting? When you Again, this is from last week, when your life is hurting, when you, when you play by the rules, when you've done what is expected of you before God and before me, and you've lived a responsible life. You've done everything you know to do, crossed every, every T, dotted every I, but still, still, the bottom just falls out. And not only does it, does it fall out, but it just continues to fall out. What do you do? What happens? God, I've done it right. I've lived like you told me to. I've been a faithful steward of my time, my treasure, my talent. I've done it all. I've even been there when I couldn't be there. I've been there when I shouldn't have been there. I was there for you, God, and now all this is happening. What happens when you just want the pain to stop? Here's Job. He's lost ten children. He's lost all of his animals. He's lost all of his fields. He's lost all of his equipment. He's lost all of his barns. He's lost everything. Everything he had. <clears throat> the greatest man in the land. <clears throat> Everything he had, <coughs> had and owned in a matter of days was all flat. I don't mean just taken away, flat in a matter of days. Literally, the bottom fell out. He says, though he slay me, I will trust him. You see, the Christian life is not a series of happy stories, but sometimes things get down right. In my new course I'm taking now, I'm taking another, I'm taking my fifth psychology course. This psychology course, again, has got to deal with humans because humans and psychology kind of go together. And it's biblical. And so I was going through it right to start with. Bam, 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 bam. Bad story, bad story, bad story, bad story. Hurt story, hurt story. And I was looking at it and says, if anybody thinks the Bible is just some little fairy tale book and nothing goes on in there and everything, get, get real because it's full of real life. Very full of real life, and you can go to it, you can trust it. The same way, listen, that's like the book of Job. Remember, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. There's always times, I mean, always, there's going to be times when we get hurt, and in so many different ways. Uh, uh, there's several ways. As a matter of fact, I just wrote down a few of them uh, illness, <clears throat> injustice, you've been criticized, uh, adversity, loss, stress, suffering. Needless suffering. You know, it's at these times when all this stuff <clears throat> is going on in our life that, that we actually begin to feel confused and disappointed and thinking, where's God in all this? Where's God's hand? I mean, we talk about it every Sunday. We sing about God's mighty hand. We, we think about God's mighty hand. We've seen His hand move time and time again. But right now, it's not happening. Right now, I don't know exactly what's going on. I just know, look, look. <clears throat> He says, look, he kept his faith through suffering with victory because he said, though he slay me, I will trust him. And this is where we stopped off last week, right here. So just quickly, uh, <clears throat> do the last thing we did last week and we're going on. How did Job, oh, Job, how did Job handle his hurts? What did he do? Now, this is not going to be <clears throat> the standard book of Job uh, sermon. Matter of fact, this is going to be one that's probably about one of the most down to earth, like last week. It's one of the most down to earth things. If you'll take this and study it and do what I'm getting ready to show you, you're going to find out that you can get through your hurts a whole lot quicker with a whole lot less pain, and you'll find out that you'll find God quicker if you do it right. Amen? So it's a highly handled. First off, and this is from last week, and this is where we stopped because we got so involved. Uh, don't tell God how big your don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big God is. Amen. So here it goes. Number one, he reconnected to God. The Bible said that Job got to his feet, ripped his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worshipped, and said, "Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return to the womb of the earth." God gives, God takes. God's name be ever blessed. Here's what he did. This is from last week. Number one, he got up. He refused to wallow in his pain. We wallow in pain in more than one way. There's that open mouth, and you're just going, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. That's one way to wallow in pain. Another way to wallow in pain is you just won't drop it. 
You just keep bringing it back up and keep reliving it. You regurgitate it over and over and over again. And I can tell you something. If you keep regurgitating it over and over and over again, you're going to cause irreparable damage to your spirit. Quit regurgitating everything that's ever happened bad to you because it will kill you. Amen? <clears throat> you will multiply it. You will make it extreme. It will hurt you. Number two, ripped his robe and shaved his head. He got beyond him. You know, <clears throat> if we can learn to get beyond us, <clears throat> I'm allergic to these plastic flowers. <clears throat> if we learn to get beyond ourselves, it's amazing what can happen. And finally, he fell to the ground and he worshipped. He got in a position to receive from God. That's where we stopped last week. So now, <clears throat> we're getting ready to get in deeper. Y'all ready? Everybody ready to say amen? Amen. Remember, who's this about? Every Sunday when we come in, who's this about? <clears throat> Amen. Because if we think about it, put God first, and look, it's like, remember, I told you a few weeks ago, we put God first and put His business, take care of His business, He'll take care of ours. Amen. So here we go. Number one, He reconnected to God. Number two, oh, look at it, here's His friends. Why don't we need some friends like that? Please tell me you've never been one of the guys with the rocks. I hate to say this, but I have. Years ago, I've been there. I think God showed me better. Think about it when we get ready to talk. If you're one of those guys with the rocks, I hope before this service is over, if you throw that rock down and you realize the danger that's involved for both of you when you try to help somebody by beating him up instead of lifting him up. So here we go. <clears throat> you got to find a support base. See, this man was visited by so-called comforters, but they weren't very good support. Let me just kind of give you a little scenario, okay? He's going to say this. They sat with him, and they stared at him for seven days. <clears throat> can you imagine? <clears throat> I'm fine. If I, can ever, if I can ever get it up. <clears throat> All right. This is, look, I'm going to tell you, this is just, uh, this, we're going to get through this, amen, because this is important. Are you ready? They stared at him for seven days, quiet, and then they started blaming him. If you'd have been better, this wouldn't have happened. If you'd have known God better, this wouldn't have happened. If you hadn't sinned, obviously everybody thinks you're the greatest man in the land, but if you hadn't sinned, this wouldn't have happened. Your children brought it on themselves. Can you imagine you're trying to lift up somebody and you're telling them all that? These guys in their attempt to lift him up now just keep telling him how sorry he is before God and how he brings on all the trouble himself. So they end up blaming him. Let me just tell you something about that. When people get around you and you're going through something and you get judgment from them, a lot of times, listen careful, a lot of times our judgment of others is a denial of the possibility that we could go through the same thing. Listen to that carefully. <clears throat> our judgment for others is a denial that we can wind up doing the same thing. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever told anybody, but it's because of the life you lived and because of how, how you didn't do right before God, man, you've got this coming on, and then later on it happens to you? Wow. What I've learned is I've learned to keep me some heavenly duct tape in my car, in my Bible. And I've learned to put it on my mouth. I walked in one place uh, with Bethany, and they said, we need to check your pockets for weapons. And I heard two people behind me talking junk about somebody. And so I pulled out my knife and I gave it to them. They said, good. They looked behind me. They asked the person behind me, those ladies behind me who were running their mouth about somebody. They said, do y'all have any weapons? They said, no. They said, you can come by. And that man said, no, you should have got some duct tape for them. Because their weapons are right here. You see, when somebody's hurt, they don't need blame. They don't need somebody to beat them up. You know what? Remember, you can go through the same thing. There's a difference in lifting up and beating up. So let me explain this. I'm going to try to bring this down as far down to earth as I can bring this. Get ready. Okay. 
Pity, sympathy, empathy, compassion. Y'all say it with me. Pity, sympathy, empathy, compassion. Now, now, now watch this now. <clears throat> Pity. I go by a house that's on fire. I'm riding in a town, I don't know anything about anybody. I'm riding through town and I see a, a fire in the middle of the night. <clears throat> I'm riding by, I see the fire trucks out, I see the rescue squad, and I see them bringing people out. I see them working on people and seeing things happen. I don't know anybody, and it's all looking like they're all happy. they got it pretty well taken care of, but it's still looking bad. I walk by and I go right by and I go, Bless the Lord. Yeah, that's what some do. Bless the Lord. Mm -hmm. I had pity on them. But here's the difference. Now, here's pity now. Pity, listen to this. Pity is when, watch this. There's so, this is how it should be, and this is how it works. This is what I'm trying to explain something here. Pity, I may have never seen them. I may never even know them. So there is no knowledge. There is no connection. And so their pain does not affect me other than me going, Lord bless them. All right? That's pity. We all have a certain amount of pity. Then there's sympathy. Now I arrive by this house and I notice it's my neighbor's house. Down the road somewhere, I don't really, you know, I, I, I talked to him only about a minute ago by, but we never really had supper together or anything, but he's, he, he's my neighbor. And so now, sympathy, I have a limited knowledge of the person going through the thing. <clears throat> so, limited knowledge, limited connection, <clears throat> sympathy. I'm still feeling a little bit deeper than somebody I don't know, but at the same time, it doesn't make me respond like I should to him. Now, pity. Never seen him, don't know him, no knowledge of him, no connection. My neighbor, limited knowledge of them, limited knowledge, limited connection. I probably got to know, I can do a whole lot because I don't really know much about them. But now I drive by my brother's house on the fire. It didn't really mean a whole lot other than Lord help them when it was somebody I had no idea when they were from the town. It sort of got to me a little bit when now it's my neighbor who lives down the road and I know a little bit about him but not a lot. Okay, uh, if they have a drive down here, I'll come and I'll give them a drive. And it reminds me of the time <clears throat> the guy was trying to get this other guy's neighbor to go to church. The guy that's right next door to the church, he kept asking him to go to church. They never would go. For 10 years, he'd invited him to church and he wouldn't go. One night, the church caught on fire. So the guy who went to the church was out fighting the fire and the neighbor who had never come to church they were accepting the invitation, came over with him, was helping fight the fire. <clears throat> and he said, I've invited you for 10 years to come to this church. You never come. Why'd you come tonight? He said, well, your church has never been on fire before. <laughs> Get on fire, and they'll come. Amen? So, so here we go. <clears throat> empathy. Here we go. With the empathy, now it's part of me. It's part of my family. It is, I've got connections now. And because I have connections, and, and, and now I have, a, before, no knowledge, limited knowledge, now I have an intimate knowledge of those people. And now it hurts dearly. I was in the dentist chair the other day, and my, my, uh, uh, Larry's daughter is a dental assistant at, at the dentist. And I'm at the dentist, and I've never seen her there before. And so I'm in there getting getting worked on, and I'm laying in the chair, and all you can see is my head because I'm wearing this thing. And she comes in, and she goes, Uncle Cricket! And there's nothing to get to but my head. So she reaches over and puts me in a headlock. I look at her and say, that's an awful big tater for you to try to hold, girl. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And she kissed me on the forehead, and she left. Because you know why? She walked by that door many times, but now she saw her uncle in that chair. Made a difference. So watch this now. No knowledge, no connection, limited knowledge, limited connection, an intimate knowledge, an intimate connection. Now I'm going to jump out my car and I'm going to run there and see what I can do. Now I'm going to see, because I, I know who's in that house. Is my brother out? Is his wife out? Is his children out? Is his grandchild out? Is there somebody, somebody helping somebody? What can I do to help? Give me a hose. Do something. Help me. And then there is compassion. Compassion is when you rise up 
and do something. You relieve the suffering. Now watch this. If all you got is pity for everybody, you'll never rise up. If all you got is sympathy for them, you may rise up, but it'll be limited. But if you got empathy, you'll do what it takes. And so I ask God all the time, God, matter of fact, empathy, sympathy is when I, pity is when I see it, sympathy is when I acknowledge it, empathy is when I enter it. Help me to enter the pain so that I can do what I can to stop it. I was telling my neighbor last night, he was talking to me, asking how Beth was doing, I said, I have worked with cancer patients, including my own mama who had it in her belly. I said, I worked with cancer patients for 30 years, and I said, it, I, and I always tried to consider what they felt like, and I tried to consider what the family felt like, and I always tried to be there. I said, I even had somebody one time tell me, uh, you really go overboard with some of this stuff. You go and buy stuff to people that, that, that I, don't, I wouldn't do it. I don't know what you're doing. And I said, because I try to put myself in their place. And now, now that I have a daughter with that, and that's every day doing something, you know, uh, and then now I'm giving her chemo. I woke up and gave her chemo this morning. Said, Everything's timed. Everything you got to do. I gave her her thyroid medicine at 6.30. I gave her chemo at 7. I gave her a breakfast at 8. And then at 5, I give her more medicine. Then I give her some more medicine. And, you know, uh, I have to give her chemo. I give her medicine before, before 5. And she has to be through eating. And then I give her chemo at 7. And then go back and give her more medicine at 8. And it's bam, 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 bam. Every day. You know what? All that stuff I did all those years for all those people. And, 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 and again, some people said you went overboard. No, I didn't. Because now that I'm in it, I feel like I didn't have enough empathy. Now that I'm in it, I was thinking, you know what? Wow. I really wanted to be empathetic and I thought I was, but not like I am now. And so it's changed my whole outlook on a whole, a lot of things. It changed so much that a lady came out of the hospital the other day. <clears throat> I was there picking up Bethany for one of her stays. I think it was her nine-day stay. I'm picking up, there's, a, there's an old lady and her husband. I told us about this on Tuesday night. Lady and her husband, they're sitting out there and they go, I'm here because I've got cancer in my chest, lung cancer, and they're doing a biopsy tomorrow. And she said, I can't even afford a taxi to get across town. And I said, I got it. Come on, I'll take you. So I put her and her husband in the car in their bags. And they, they, I thought they were moving into the place. And I said, where do you want to go? They said, everybody to Old Walmart. I said, well, I'll take you there. And Linda and Bethany were in another car. And we're going along there behind us. And they see a hotel right there. A car behind uh, Taco Bell. And i got several things I'll throw in this right now. All free of charge. Get ready. Didn't even cost the price of the ticket today. Get rid of She says, there's all the two older people. She goes, you know what? There's a hotel right there. I said, yes, ma'am. She says, could you take us there instead? Sure. As I'm getting her bags out of the car, she says, well, and she finds a pastor. She said, pastor, I really can't afford it tonight. And i got to come back tomorrow. Is there any way you can help? And so I said, Okay. And I reached in my pocket, and it was kind of slim, because it's not cheap at the hospital for nine days. So I said, I'm sitting there in that little bit, and I said, well, that's about it. And the Lord spoke to me again. I've told you all this before. If what you have is not enough to meet your need, then consider it your seed. Plan it. I said, okay, let's go. We went inside, the lady said, I was thinking it would be $100, $150. I was thinking, oh, Lord, I can't. Uh, but you said plan it, so I'm going to plan it. So I go up there, and the woman says, oh, you get a senior citizen rate. And believe it or not, it was $40. I fell out. I don't know if everybody's just $40. Or if the Lord spoke to her and made her say $40. I don't know because I had $40 in my pocket, but I said I gave her $40. I had 50, so I gave her 40. <clears throat> and, then, and then I took the rest of it and gave her and said, Y'all go get y'all supper at Taco Bell. She said, Thank you, sir. And, and so I left. And so I'm say is, though, here I am with Bethany. And I got a different kind of empathy than I had before.
And I probably would have helped them out anyway. But especially while she said it was all about lung cancer and she's scared to death and her husband's there and you know, they're there and all and I said, and when she said, and I can't even get across town, I thought, you know what? I'm going to get her across town one way or another. She's going to get it. And then we stopped at the hotel and all that stuff. But you know what? Empathy makes you do something. Because empathy leads to compassion. The Bible says before Jesus healed anybody, what did he say? He was filled with compassion. Then he healed them. Because compassion is empathy in action. So now, here's Job. He's hurt. And his friends have pity. His friends even have sympathy. <clears throat> but that's as far as it goes. Because all they can do is throw judgment. And when somebody's hurting, they don't need judgment. They need somebody to love them. So, find your support base. Once you find your support base, make sure it's a good support base. How somebody's going to judge you, somebody's going to beat you up or tear you down. Because whatever you're going through is beating you up and tearing you down enough. Find somebody you can talk to, somebody you can lean on, somebody if it's just to just to, to make a phone call to us and say, look, I'm having a bad day, can I just get it off my chest? Sure, go ahead. And boom, there it is. So, 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 and that's what's been so great about Amaius too. Those guys, I mean, it's, it's, it's just constant. It's, it's been, it's been an, amazing, an amazing thing with, with them. So here we go. Let's see. So now, sometimes you just have to bow your head. Say a prayer and weather a storm. Sometimes you just have to bow your head and say, God, I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't understand, but I will trust you and love you until the very end. Just like that song. I will love you until my very breath leaves my body. So now, here we go. Trust God when you don't understand. Romans 8, 28. You have to believe that God's got this. You have to believe that God has the greatest empathy of all because He sent His Son, Jesus, who suffered and bore His stripes on His back for our sickness. He's got the greatest empathy of anybody that's ever been. He's not just talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. The Bible says in James, if you got a brother and he's cold and you got two coats and you just tell him to be warm, what you done? Nothing. Talk is cheap. Compassion is action. Empathy in action. So now, now here we go. When you're down to nothing, you got to believe that God is up to something. Job lost everything he had. The only thing he had left was a nagging wife. This is it. And we went to pick on her, but you know what? She watched her husband. She lost everything too. Not just Job, but she lost everything too. And then she watched her husband as his body got riddled with pain and temperatures of 105 and all this stuff, his hallucinations, all kinds of stuff from his pain. And so we could talk junk about her, but she was going through pain too. She was hurting. And so here she is. She's the only one. But you know what? He said, God's got this. You see, and I sent this out as a mighty army not long ago. When you can't see God's hand, you can trust his heart. When you can't see God moving, you can trust His heart. You can know and you can believe that God has your best interest at heart. I don't know how many have seen The Shack or read The Shack. But that movie is about hurt and about healing. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend to see the movie. Unless you're just a big reader, then read it. But I, I, I rather look at the movie. Amen. So, so we look at the movie. It's about hurt beyond compare. And how God heals that hurt. Not by denying it. Not by pushing it down. Uh, bringing it to the surface. And letting the Holy Spirit do His work. 
Trust God when you don't understand. And then, follow this. If you don't know my pain, you'll never understand my praise. Woo! Sometimes some of the people that are making the shoutest, the loudest shout and reason of praising the greatest praise, you're thinking, man, they got it made. Some of them are hurting the worst. You can look at me, <laughs> look, it says you can look at me all crazy if you want. If you don't know my pain, you'll never understand my praise. Watch this. God revealed himself to Job through his suffering. Wait a minute now, wait a second. What in the world? Whoa, 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 whoa. God revealed himself through the suffering of Job. You see, they all had limited knowledge. His buddies were judging him on a limited knowledge. That's why God tells us not to judge one another. Because we have a limited knowledge. We have a limited knowledge of God. We have a limited knowledge of the situation. We have a limited knowledge of the person that we're judging. So we are not to judge. Because when we start judging people, Number one is we're doing it all limited knowledge. I get sometimes sometimes tired of hearing somebody, and I got some of my family right now, so I'm just telling it like it is. And one day that person was sitting there and they were eating somebody else up, and they went, I'm just telling it like it is. And I said, Can you do me a favor? And they said, Well, I said, Will you please quit saying that? And they said, Well, somebody needs to. I said, Well, you're not the one. I said, because anyone one in this whole conversation knows how it is. And they said, who's that? I said, God. You can say, this is how I see it. But you can't tell this is how it is because you ain't God. I even told that person one day, I said, I'm glad I ain't God. He said, why? He said, I'd like to be God. I said, I'm glad I'm not. He said, why? I said, because some people come up and pray to me and I just go, so I never do it. And I go, yeah, right. No, you won't. Of course, he got quiet. Here we go. Job came to know God better through his experiences. You know, he speaks to him in the whirlwind. And as God is speaking through the whirlwind, all of a sudden now things start changing. You see, Job up to this point had not been in a position to hear. He would heard his friends. His friends told him how sorry he was. The Bible says Job, after his friends got through encouraging him, said, I wish I was never born. I curse the day I was ever born. Wow. That's rough. And now God comes and starts talking. And when God comes to the world, he says, Joe, where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I did these things? Where were you when all this stuff happened? And now Job's starting to get a different perspective. Matter of fact, now, now uh, uh, he's in that position to hear. And so now Job repents and he begins to see God in a whole new light. The Bible says in 42, 5 and 6, it says, I only had heard about you before. Listen to this carefully. Now, this is what pain will do for you and suffer. I'd only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take everything back I said. I sit in dust and ashes and show my repentance. Wow. He told God, so God, there's no days in between us. There's nobody that can reach down to me and reach up to you. How do you know how I feel, God? Well, he sent Jesus, who was the days when he reached up on the cross and grabbed God by one hand and reached down and grabbed us by the other. He knows what it feels like. God was, he was correct about that. God did not know what Job was experiencing other than he was because of his omniscience. But, but as far as personal experiencing, he had but Jesus Christ did, and even more. And so he says, guys, you don't even know how this is going. You don't even know how I feel. And God speaks out the world and says, where were you, son, when I did this? Where were you, son, when I did that? And if you just sit down and listen for a minute, I'll talk to you. But up until that point, he weren't ready to be talked to. Some of us in here, we would get along a whole lot better if we could learn to get in a position to hear what other people are saying. The right people, not the wrong people. Okay. So now, I had only heard about you, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said. Wow. I sit. Uh, and I sit in dust and ashes and I, and I show my repentance. Wow. Learn what you can from your experience. I don't ask God why with Bethany. I didn't ask what God why with my wife. I didn't ask God why with my mother. I didn't ask God why with a lot of people that I held their hand in death or went to their bedside when they were hurting. 
or went with them through their suffering. I, I quit saying why, and I just started saying, God, what do you want me to learn from this? Show me what to learn from this. Help me know what you're trying to teach me in all of this, because I know that pain has a purpose. God does not allow pain without purpose. Every pain is productive if you'll let it be. God loves us that much. He loves us so much that He wants to be spoiled brats to just speak the word and then He's just going to give it to us like a cosmic sugar daddy. He allows us to go through things. Number one, for, for, for uh, show the devil that people still serve Him anyway. Number two, to show others what it's like when you're suffering and to show yourself, you know what, God? Though you say, I'm still going to trust you. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to trust you. So now, you heard what you get from the experience. Here's, here's the hard one. When you let go of past hurts, forgive those who have wronged you and learn to forgive yourself for your own mistakes. There goes the hard one. Ready? Y'all ready for the hardest one of all? Y'all say that out loud like Jeff. Ready? Or like Wheel of Fortune when they say it out loud everybody say it. Y'all sound like the Cole Haynes. You know which one you want us to say. Just the top. Just the top. Just the top. Ready? Learn to forgive others. Y'all say it again. Y'all almost sound like you meant it. Learn to forgive others. Let me ask you a question. How many in here have ever needed forgiveness? Raise your hand. I put up both feet, but I hit my hiney on the ground. I ain't, I ain't got wings yet. <laughs> How many's ever needed forgiveness and asked forgiveness of somebody and they didn't give it to you? How'd it feel? One of the toughest things to do when you're hurt is learn to forgive others. Those guys that beat him up, raked him over the coals, they had just slammed him. They had beat him every which way from Tuesday. They told him how sorry he was, that, that he just hadn't lived up to his reputation, that God didn't love him anymore, that his children deserved everything they got. They just beat him and lamb blasted him and beat him and beat him and beat him. Then he's going to God because now he can't hardly stand it because he's been beat up and he feels like God's in there holding, holding, holding the stone and also beating him up. So his friends are beating him up. God's beating him up. He tells God, you don't know what I'm going through. God says, you're correct. You know, but guess what? Where were you, big boy, when I created the world? Where were you, big boy, when this big old, big old animal's coming? They have to be in my restraint. Talk to me, son. Talk to me. You see, learn to forgive others. In order for God to do his healing of Job before he ever healed him, this happened over a nine-month period. Can you imagine nine months to a year? of a trial like that, of temperatures of 105 for almost a year, boils on your body and hurting for over a year, having your friends come to you and beat you up constantly for months, feel like God has just left you because you can't even hear God talk, you can't even, your prayers, you feel like you're going up to the dump and it just fall right down your face, nine months to a year. But you see, when God spoke to him, he spoke to Job, but not only did he speak to Job, but let me say what I did to Job first. We need to turn loose and not hurt on, hold on to hurt feelings. Some of y'all in here right now, listen carefully what I'm getting ready to say because this will change your life today, right now, this moment. Not my promise, but God's. God just spoke to me and my spirit so strong right then, stronger than I could ever imagine. You could ever even think. Some of us are going through some experiences like Job, and if we can learn to forgive those that we feel like put us there, we will get immediate healing. I can't say it one more time, because if you ain't, ain't going to accept it, it ain't, it's, it's, it's wasting breath. Ready? Some of us are going through Job-like experiences, and if we can learn to forgive those that have hurt us, and even, been, even the cause of what we're going through, if we could learn to forgive them, we would, accept, we, would, we would receive immediate, immediate relief. And God would start to work in our life. You see, see what I see this. Job's situation turned around with two parts. First, God's timing. 
Remember this. God's time. It's not going to last forever. I promise you. It's not going to last forever. This too shall pass. There's going to come a time when God's going to stand up and say, enough's enough. That's not my word. That's God's word. When God's allowing things in our life, He does know there's a beginning and there's an end. There's always an end. If there's a beginning, there's always an end. There's never an end without a beginning and a beginning without an end. God will one day step up and say, enough is enough. But until that time comes, we can prolong when He says that. Remember, God's time. We can prolong that when we fail to trust Him. I want you to listen carefully. Failure to forgive those that hurt you shows a lack of trust in what God said. I remember when D.C. and Daniel were little boys. They would climb up anywhere, they'd be anywhere. They could be up in the air, they could be up on the roof, wherever they go. And they would say, I'm here, Daddy, you going to catch me or catch me, Daddy? And because they knew I would stop whatever I was doing, I would drop everything because I knew those rascals would jump. Mm -hmm. I'd drop everything I had and I'd turn and try to find them because they were in the air. And I'd catch them. And as far as I know, I never dropped anyone. Let me know. Drop you these things. Don't remember. By the time I hit you on the head, Dr. Maybe you hit you, don't remember that one. <laughs> catch me, Daddy. They trusted that I had their best interest in heart, and no matter what I was doing, I would drop what I was doing, and I'd turn around and I'd catch them. I'm an earthly father. What about a heavenly father? Can't we trust him? And he says, if you'll just learn to forgive, I will bring healing in your life. And then we don't forgive, what are we saying? I don't think God meant what he said. I don't think our heavenly father really meant what he said, because I can't forgive. Healing starts. Now, God didn't just speak to Job. At the same time, God was speaking to Job's friends. Did you know that? And he told Job's friends, said, y'all know what y'all talking about. As a matter of fact, the best thing you can do is when Job comes around here to pray for y'all, you let him pray for y'all and y'all offer sacrifices to me right before him. Repent. Y'all repent. I don't want each one of you to get out some coins and to go near me. I want you to give it to him. Okay. So the Bible says that when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before because none of his friends come around his friends had condemned him, but everybody around came around and they put in the Job Fund and it was amazing what had happened. If that's where it stopped, that'd be awesome, but that's not where it stopped. This is what I've been waiting for. I studied the book of Job for 30 years and never have I seen what I'm getting ready to show you until I was working this sermon. Ready? The story starts badly, but it ends with recovery, because watch this. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than the beginning, for now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named the first daughter Jemiah, the second daughter Keziah, and the third daughter Kareen Hapak. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job. And their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Get ready. I'm going to show you something. First, let me just tell you. He got doubled everything but his kids. Everything was doubled except for his kids. He had ten children, seven sons, three daughters. He got back seven sons and three daughters. Why? Because everything else was just temporal. His children were eternal. All those oxen, all those sheep, 
all that land was all temporal. I've never seen a I've never seen a hearse carry a U-Haul by. It's all temporal. But his children are eternal. And so when he gets to heaven, he's already got ten waiting for him, and then the other ten come up behind him. He had all twenty in heaven. Watch this though. This is the part I I'd seen it but not seen it. It was hid right in pure daylight. And not even studied it before. And it just it's just amazing to me. Get ready. I love this. This was written by somebody during the Holocaust. This was written on one of the, I think it was Austerwitz. This was written on one of the walls. Well, these guys were dying daily, starving to death, put in furnaces and burned up. He put, I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I'm alone. I believe in God, even when he's silent. Wow. You know how bad those guys have. Watch this. This is it. This is the part. Y'all, y'all, I want everybody to sit down. I want to music, right? Start with music, start afterwards. I don't want anybody to miss this. Ready? You got double for his trouble. How many can stand some double for your trouble? Get ready. I love this. He named his daughters according to his healing process. You know, when, when, when Joseph, Joseph did the same thing when he had uh, uh, Ephraim, and I can't even think of the son's name right now, Ephraim was told him? Manessa. Manessa, that's right. Yeah, he was a messer. <laughs> he was a spoiled kid. He was a messer. Ready? Manessa and Ephraim mean, watch this, God has caused me to forget, and God has given me double for my trouble. That's what the two names mean. Watch this now. Jemima means day by day peace. Keziah means as cassia, spice means perfume. And Kareem, Hapak means makeup or to make beautiful. So watch this. I love it. This is so awesome. Some of y'all can do this right now if you would just learn to do what Job did. Ready? It didn't happen overnight. But day by day. Y'all say day by day. Every day God gave him peace. And he began to spice up his life. Jemiah, day by day he gave him peace. Because I was day by day in peace. Day by day he gave him peace. And God began to spice up his life, Kesiah, and make something beautiful out of it again. Wow. Wow. I just can't get enough of that. I've read this over and over again. It just brought tears to my eyes constantly to read this. Day by day. Y'all say this to me. Put your own self in this. Day by day, God gives me peace. Y'all say that. Day by day, God gives me peace. Day by day, God begins to spice up my life again. Day by day, God's going to make something beautiful out of it again. He did a very long life. He was known throughout all the land of being a great man. God blessed his latter end double. Blessed him so good. But there was that time when everything was so inside out, upside down, backwards, not forwards. Everything was going crazy. It's like you couldn't even get a break because something else was happening. You couldn't get a break because something else was happening. You know, I was thinking about that last night. I was thinking about this sermon last night. While I'm thinking about this sermon, I was outside and I had a leak. I had a leak at one of the sides of my house. And so I'm trying to I climb on the ground. I was trying to get this leak taken care of, do some landscaping. And I'd already put a French drain there. And, and, and I'm trying to get it straight. So I'm already nasty. I'm trying to get that straight. And about the time that, I walk around and, and I see a hose over here. I see a hose at the garden hose and a hose going into the pool area and that, all that stuff, all that stuff at that. Side out there outside, and I see another hose in this, and it's busting. So I'm trying to get that hose fixed, and I'm trying to get the hose fixed. Water went all over me. So I got water all over me. And then I knew that by the time I'm trying to get this water right here, my air conditioner goes, Whee! I'm like, Oh no, is that a capacitor bearing? Is that my exact evaporator fan? What is that? And I said, Beth is in the house, and she can't afford to be hot. And I'm going back and forth on those things, I'm thinking, Boom, 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 boom. And so, I got on the phone and I, and I called Chris and I got on the phone and I had a home warranty. I called that. 
I'm going back and forth. I'm trying to put everything back together again, putting the hoses back together again, fixing everything. And it's all at one time. It's just like one would, while I'm working on one, another one's going. It just kept on. And there's about five or six things happening. Bam, 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 bam. And as it's happening, bam, 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 bam. I'm thinking, this is minor compared to you lost everything you owned. You lost all your animals. And while one guy finally quit talking, now you've lost all your land crops. And while you're still talking, no one says, and now all the buildings have collapsed. And then you hear, now you've lost all your children. Bam, 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 bam. Wow. God always has a purpose for your pain. Always has a purpose. He never wastes your pain. Because if nothing else, it'll help you be have empathy. The next time God wants to use you in a situation, and normally you'd walk away, but now because you have empathy, you stay and you do it. You know. Everybody that's saying, guys, y'all come on up here. Job, according to his friends, deserved everything he got, and then some. Job didn't understand, and the whole problem was all of them had a partial knowledge about what was going on. They didn't know that God had spoke to the Satan, and Satan had spoke back to God, and it was uh, God bragging on Job. Didn't realize there's a bragging. You know, sometimes I wish God wouldn't brag on somebody sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Don't brag on me, God. God was bragging on Job. He was trying to show Satan that he had some people that would love him and serve him no matter what. There was a whole lot of testing going on. Satan was being tested. Job was being tested. His friends were being tested.
purpose. God sees it. He wants you to reconnect to Him. Find a good support base. Trust God even though you don't understand. Learn from what you've experienced. Forgive others. And expect God to turn your life around. I'm going to pray for you right now. And then we're going to open up the altars. Lord, all those that had their hands raised. Those that wanted to raise them but didn't. Lord, I ask you to meet their need right now. Let them know, God, that you see them. That you know what's happening in their life. That you're not being silent to punish them. But the teacher is always silent during test time. Help them understand something special along the way. Turnaround's coming. And when turnaround comes, it's going to be an awesome, awesome day. Find up their wounds. Lift up their spirits.
the hand and you can believe so I'll be there. Speaking of so I'm in there, how you doing, sister? Oh, God, we can't. 